Uh, We are going to be in Matthew's gospel here uh, tonight, uh, chapter 13. You can go ahead and flip over that way. Um, As you'll see, uh, we're skipping over a little section. Um, We're going to cover that actually next week. Next week we're going to... I already talked to you guys um, last April when we did the church survey. Um, We talked to people about what, what do you need? Like, what do you want to grow as a follower of Jesus? And it was, I mean... I don't know, like, the percentage of people who said this, but it was a high percentage said, I want to learn how to share my faith. I want to learn evangelism. Um, And and as a pastor, that warms my heart because you guys see that this is each one of our duty. It's each one of our calling. And so uh, starting next week, and and I would say even this week has to do with evangelism too, we're going to be focusing on evangelism for about eight weeks or so, something like that. And then we're going to start somewhat of a church campaign uh, around the question of who, who is Jesus. There's no more important question that anyone on this planet will have to answer than who is Jesus. Um, and, and right, so we'll start a little church campaign, and you know what we're going to get into after that? The Gospel of John, to tell us exactly who Jesus is. And so for the next eight weeks or so, I don't know, uh, we'll see, uh, we're going to be talking about evangelism, uh, going through the scriptures, we'll be in Acts quite a bit, uh, talking about how to share our faith and what that looks like today. And so, um, the parable section, we will go over that next week when we get into um, Isaiah 6. But let's go ahead and read it today. So we're going to start in Matthew 13. We'll go verses 1 through 9, and then we'll skip forward to verses 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him. So he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grains, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And then the disciples go on to ask, why do you speak to us in parables? We get into that section, and then Jesus explains it in verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and prove it unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I pray um, tonight that uh, we would have ears to hear. God, that you would convict us. God, that um, we want to be that healthy soil that produces fruit. So, God, if there is anything holding any of us back from that, I pray that you would show us tonight, that you would convict us through the power of your Spirit, that uh, you would strengthen us and help us to completely surrender before you, that um, we may be vessels to go out into this world and to do your will. God, uh, whatever gets in our way of that, please show us. We want to live completely for you. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, as we talk about this parable, the first thing is the seed and the sower, they don't change throughout, right? Uh, What changes throughout is the soil. The seed and the sower are the same. The sower is Jesus, preaching the word of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the teachings of the kingdom, the ways of the kingdom. And that is what the seed is, the word of the kingdom. So the sower is Jesus, the seed is the word of the kingdom, it says. What changes is the type of soil. Now, the type of soil represents the hearts of those who hear this word of 
the kingdom. Now, when we talk about the heart in the Bible, it's quite different from what we might think. The, the heart in the Bible is the center of who we are. It's the center of our existence, our being. It's who we are. It's what controls our feelings, our words, our action, our will, the decisions we make. It's like our control center out of every, from which everything else flows. And that's why you see in the New Testament, like Jesus, you get to the Sermon on the Mount, a bunch of Jesus' other teaching, he's concerned about your heart. Because if you change your heart, you change everything else, right? Everything flows from the heart. So everything we think, do, or say starts in our heart heart, and that is what the soil represents. So the first thing we see is the hard soil. We see this in verse 4. In verse 19, it's like a path, right? It's a trodden path, like concrete, right? But it's dirt. Um, Verse 19 tells us, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. It speaks of someone with a proud, stubborn heart. Could have been talking about the Pharisees and the scribes here. A proud heart is not able to understand. It says they don't understand the word that's being preached to them. A proud heart can't understand the teachings of Jesus. It can't understand the teachings of the kingdom, which are centered on humility and selflessness. The exact opposite. James 4, 6. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. A life that is centered on ourself, our own desires, our own aspirations. Can't comprehend what it means when Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life, whoever wants to keep his life is going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, that is the one who will find true life. A proud heart that's just obsessed with itself in its own way can't comprehend that. It doesn't understand because it's opposed to that lifestyle. Go ahead and open up to Ephesians chapter 4, that passage right up there, verse 17. Apostle Paul talks about hard-heartedness. And Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and he says, Now this I say in testifying the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Paul says that the Gentiles' hard hearts are due to their unwillingness to repent. Their unwillingness to repent of their self-centeredness. It's all about them and their own sensualities, their own desires. They're not willing to deny themselves that Jesus calls them to. They're not willing to be made new, not willing to be born again. They're not a new creation in Christ because they want to continue to live for themselves. Now, I have heard unbelievers, I have heard professing Christians say things like, when it comes to their behavior, well, I was born this way. This is how God made me. God gave me these desires. Why why wouldn't he want me to act on them? Generally, it's used as an excuse to disobey God and his commands. It's an excuse, and we've probably all done it, to live the life that we desire. We want to live the way we do, and I don't know. Why, Why would God give me those desires? To be mad at that guy if he didn't want me to punch him right in the face, right? I made that up on the fly. I don't know. Um... But why, right? We, we try to, like, justify our sin in that way. It's an excuse to disobey God. First and foremost, like, we have to know that just because we have certain desires doesn't mean they're good or that they're from God. Quite obvious. It's quite possible for that not to be the case, especially if your heart does not belong to God. 
I've had a whole lot of desires in my life, most of which I've all had to repent of because it went against the will of my, my Lord, right? It went against that lifestyle that says your will be done in everything. What we have to keep in mind as Christians is to the one who says, I was born this way, what's Jesus say? You must be what? You must be born again. To the one who says, God gave me these desires, Jesus says, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. To the one who says, this is how God made me, the apostle Paul writes, take off the old self and put on the new. The hard-hearted, proud person, those who are living for themselves, can't hear Jesus' teaching. It's made me think of this scene from Dumb and Dumber, Right? Just go like that. I don't want to hear it. La, 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 right? Jesus' teaching can't penetrate a proud heart because it won't let it in. And what happens is while the seed is lying there, it says Satan comes and swoops in and gobbles it up so it's forgotten. Satan comes in. You're not in the wrong. God made you perfect. God gave you those desires. You should follow, follow through on them. Why would God give you those if he didn't want you to act on them? This life is about you, 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 you. You do what makes you happy. Now, we have a lot of young parents here. Um, and it, I don't know if you heard me say, but we need more Sunday school teachers, okay? But we have lots of young parents here. And... Um, one of the popular teachings, what you see all the time is we sit our kids down and say, you can do whatever you want to do in this life. You just need to follow your dreams, right? And I think sometimes, even if we have good intentions, we inadvertently teach our children that this life might just be all about them and their dreams and their desires when they do that instead of teaching them to seek God's will for their life and everything. We need to teach them that Jesus is a shepherd and we are the sheep and we are to be led by him wherever we go. He is not a magic genie who comes right alongside us in order for our dreams and desires to become a reality. That's not who Jesus is. He's the Lord. We serve him. He doesn't serve us. I think the best thing we can teach our children, or one of the best things we can teach our children in this life, is that it's not about them. This life isn't about you. Because the media and everyone else, commercials are going to say, this life is all about you all the time. So do what makes you. It's not about you. Your life is not about you. It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. All of it. It's about living for Jesus, not for our own dreams, our own desires, seeking his way, not our own. So we have the hard soil, the hard heart. Next we have the rocky soil. It talks about that in verses 5 through 6 and 20 through 20. One, as for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. It's a shallow faith. It's actually no faith at all. It's a fair-weather Christian. Oh, I'll follow God when it's 75 degrees and sunny out, but if it starts raining, I ain't following Jesus, Right? It says they received it with joy. There's lots of emotion here, right? I think it's like a summer camp. I've been to Young Life Camp. I've been to lots of youth camps. You take kids. And they go and they, things are different and the focus on God and they're away from their friends or away from their families and everything. And they're hit with all this emotion and then in, 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 they just give their life to the Lord right there. Or they say a prayer or they do something, right? And they come back and they're on fire for the Lord for a little bit. 
or I see it with adults who come to church and maybe they're really hurt and really struggling. They're they're going through a tough time in their lives and then they'll get down there. Oh, Lord, yes, help me. And, And things get better for a time, right? And they're like, yeah. And then bad things happen on account of the faith and they're like, oh, no thanks. You might have to go back to school after giving your life to the Lord and say, hey, well, it's going to be really hard to follow Jesus and continue to hang out with these friends right here because they want nothing to do with him and are living in a way that is completely opposed to him. It's one that might get hard to follow Jesus. Family might think you're a weirdo for believing in a guy who rose from the dead. You might get made fun of. You might get mocked. You might be called ignorant. You might be called a bigot. Oh, maybe in our lifetimes we'll actually see some real persecution too. Then what? This is speaking of the person when the hard times come, just says, I'm out. I'm done. I think as we continue to see our country more and more hostile to Christian truth and morality, we're going to see more and more lukewarm Christians fall away from the true faith. It's already happened. I want you to check your heart right now. If you come to church because it makes you feel good about yourself, you're going to fall away eventually. If you come to church because this is a nice social club and all your friends come here and that's the reason why you come to church, you're going to fall away. If you come to church to please your parents or other people, you're going to fall away someday. Go ahead and turn over to Luke 12. Uh, Verse 25. That's not right. Hey, who's the first one who can tell me the cost of discipleship? I know I'm close. 14, I'm sorry, 1425. 1425. My bad. Jesus says, oh, 25, here you go. Now great crowds accompanied him, being Jesus, and he turned and said, okay, so I'm gonna, I've said this many times before. Every time you read those words, and great crowds accompany Jesus, get ready, because he's going to lay it down. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not sit, sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish All who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not first sit down and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple." You will not find any place in the scriptures where Jesus does not command complete commitment and devotion from his disciples. He doesn't actually want you to hate your parents there, okay? He's, he's speaking in hyperbole. So as long as if you want to value your parents, you want to value your loved ones more than me, you're not worthy of me. You don't get it. The allegiance and commitment to me should be so much greater than that that it's as if you hate them. We are here for Jesus. That is why we come to church. That is why we gather to learn from Jesus, to worship Jesus, to praise Jesus. If you're not here for Jesus, then I can't tell you that you belong to him. And when times get tough, you may just fall 
away. I want to think of this as an example of, of faithfulness, right? Let's say you've been married for 10 years and it's been happy. Great marriage, right? You've both been faithful. But after 10 years, things get a little rocky, okay? Not good. And let's say the wife cheats on the husband. Would you say she was faithful? She was faithful for 10 years, though. 10 whole years, well, it was good. She only cheated when it got bad. I mean, was she faithful or unfaithful? We would all say she was unfaithful, right? Same with us in Christ. We are the bride of Christ. If we want to leave when things get rocky, would we say we were faithful or unfaithful? I'd say unfaithful. I would say we were never faithful to begin with. Uh, 1 John 2, 19 through 20. John writes, he's talking about a group of people who had left the church, and he says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. He's talking about the ends just showing. Like, the fact that they left shows that they never belonged in the first place. They were never faithful from the beginning. And then in verse 20, it's that, that part I left off. But you, he, he, cont- he contrasts them with you, true believers, those who are truly faithful. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. You have been born again. Christian is not someone who goes to church. It's not someone who seeks to live by the scriptures. It's not someone who makes a declaration of faith. Christians do all those things. We do go to church. We do seek to live by the scriptures. We do declare our faith. But that doesn't make you a Christian. A Christian is someone who has been born again by the spirit of the living God. That's what a Christian is. And if that's not you, you're not a Christian. Jesus, or I mean Paul in Romans 8, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. I don't know if you could say it any more plainly than that. And here's the deal when it comes to persecution and tribulation, all these things, the Spirit will cause you to persevere when things get tough. The Spirit will empower you to overcome the trials of this life. The Spirit will empower you to remain faithful even when it's hard. The Spirit will soften your heart. The Spirit will cause you to grow roots that can never be pulled up. The Spirit goes deep into the depths of our hearts, to that soil, until every single bit of it belongs to Christ. Spirit reveals to us who Jesus truly is. And once you know who Jesus truly is, there's no going back from that. Once you know him, you can't go back. Because you know exactly who he is. So that's the rocky soil. Next, we come to the crowded soil. Verses 5 through 6. Or, I mean, verses 7 and 22. Let me get back to it here. Verse 22. Jesus says, As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. The soil is too crowded. It's too much competition for water, for valuable nutrients. There's no fruit because it's been choked out, it says, by the love of money, by the desires of this world, the ways of this world, by our own dreams, our own desires, our jobs, our kids. Things that compete for the throne of our hearts. There is only one throne in our heart, and it's for Jesus, nothing else. Whenever we put anything else on that throne, whether it's good or bad in and of itself, it becomes an idol and it hinders any sort of fruitfulness. 
we need to ask ourselves, what is it that rules my life? Is it money? Does money rule my life? Does every decision I make in this life have to do with money? Does it guide me? What about my job? Is it my job? Does my job dictate everything that I do in this life? Does it take precedent over everything else? What about my kids? Are they the very center of my world and my life? Or is it Jesus? As we've already read, Jesus will not accept second place in our lives. Kids, jobs, and money are all great things. They're not bad things until they're idols, and then they become very hurtful things to us. They're not bad things. Kids are a huge blessing from God, but if you want to put them in the place of Christ, then they become a snare. If someone came and looked at your life, let's say they could see your heart, they could see how you think or make decisions, who or what would they say ruled it? What would they say is on the throne of your life? Let's say you had two acres of land and you were going to, wanted to plant a magnificent garden on that two acres. And let's say you see some blackberry bushes starting to sprout up. What are you going to do to those blackberry bushes, those thorns? You going to fertilize them? No siree. No siree. You'd eradicate them. You'd get completely rid of them. Why? Because you know that they're going to take over everything in that garden. There's not going to be any room for anything else to take root as long as those blackberry bushes are there. And it's the same with our idols. They must be dealt with or they will choke the life out of us, the spiritual life out of us, and we will be unfruitful. Unfruitful in the things that truly matter to God. I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. God does not care how successful you are in your career if it does not glorify him. He does give us jobs, and jobs are a good thing, and they should glorify him, and we should use it to do his will here on earth. God does not care about your bank account. He is not impressed if you are not using your money as a way to further his kingdom, to glorify him. He doesn't care how successful your children are in a worldly way. What does it matter if they don't belong to him in the end? It doesn't matter at all. The fruit that truly matters to God is eternal in nature. Now, the thing that's really struck out, and probably, I I don't know, I was just praying for this week because I didn't want to really start the evangelism thing yet. Um, I was just like, God, and usually I just pick a book of the Bible and we preach all the way through it, so I don't really have too many, like, open, like, well, what should I preach on? It's generally laid out pretty good for me, right? And really the thing that's been, I've been, like, just thinking about this passage a lot, especially as a pastor, and the thing that's really been sticking out to me deals with time and just the duration of what's going on here. I've always thought, like, when I've read this, and I preached on it probably a couple years ago when we went through the Gospel of Matthew, um, and I've always thought of the time span involved as being very short, like maybe a month or two, maybe a year tops, where these things take place, right? Now, after pastoring for over seven years and seeing and hearing lots of people's stories, I've come to realize that I think the duration of, it can be short, but I think the duration can also be much, much longer. It might be 20 to 30 years of what takes place here. I've been following an atheism subreddit, so I, so I just, it's all atheists posting all the time, and a lot of them are people who have fallen away from the faith, and I just, I think it's interesting just to hear people's stories. I don't agree with most of it, but it's still interesting to, to read. You hear these stories of people falling away, and they each seem to go in one of these three types of soils that we just talked about. A lot of people, they profess their faith. They were baptized as a child. They grew up in the church. And then throughout their life, the cares of this world choked the life out of it all. Now they're 40 and they no longer identify as a Christian. 
Others might proclaim their faith later in life, and things might go well for 10 or 15 years even. Until something happens in their life and things get tough, and then I'll, I'm done with this. Still others, like the Pharisees, the scribes, might go through the religious motions all of their lives. They might go to church. They might say their prayers before meals. Yet their heart is never soft, and it's still as hard as it always was. It's never been changed. It's never belonged to Christ. And they, so, so they go on forever in this way. The soil never changes. Hearts never change. And that's, as I look at people's stories, and just like, that's what I've seen. Like, this is not a short, this is a long amount of time. We're called to persevere through all of it. We need new hearts. Ezekiel 36 talks of the new covenant. And, and Ezekiel the prophet says, and I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. God will give us a new heart, and that's what we need. With that, we get to the good soil. Verse 23 says, As for the one that was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. He hears and he understands. Not only does he understand, he shows he understands by acting on Jesus' words. Go ahead and open up to Matthew 7 right there. This comes right at the very end in the Sermon on the Mount, probably Jesus' most famous teaching. And Jesus looks out on the crowd after going through all this, just these teachings about the kingdom of God. And they've got to be mesmerized. And then at the very end, he says this, Everyone who then hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The one who accepts the words of Jesus, who truly understands them, is the one who acts on them. And none of us are perfect in that but we seek to. It's not one in one ear, out the other. And then they produce fruit. Fruit comes from a changed heart. If you have the Spirit of the living God, we should be ever increasing in the fruits of the Spirit. Peace, love, joy, patience, peace, self-control, faithfulness. Not to say it's just like that all the time, because I know in, in times of my life, like, I gave my life to the Lord, boop! Like, I'm, I'm a brand new person right off the get-go, right? And I might struggle for a bit. But if we were to spread it out over in faithfulness, God is changing my heart to become more and more like Christ all the time. There's a change that takes place. That's what the good soil is. The the good soil is a life that's truly changed, a heart that's truly changed, that's truly following Jesus, living his way with him as king in his kingdom today. A heart that seeks the ways of God above its own is a heart that will produce fruit for the king. I think one of the points of this parable is for us not to focus on the fruit, but to focus on the soil. You might get spend so much time like focusing, oh, am, am I producing for God? Is there fruit in my life? Blah, blah, blah. It's not the point. The, the, the point is the soil. If you look at your life and you're like, I'm not seeing that in my life. I'm not seeing a change. I'm not seeing God use me. I'm not seeing these things. I'm stagnant. I've been stagnant for a long time. Well, then you better check out the soil. 
You better check out your heart. Does it belong to Jesus? Am I truly living just for him? Do I belong to him? Is he my Lord? Or is something else taking his place? When we look at the good soil, we see it's the exact opposite of all those three examples we just went through. It's not hard, it's soft. It's pliable. It's not proud, it's humble. It thinks very little of itself. Life is not about me. It's anything but about me. It's about him. You think of the potter and the clay. How's God going to mold you into what he wants if you're just hard? How does that work? It must be pliable. It must be soft. It must be humble. Healthy soil is not shallow but deep. It doesn't depend on just emotions or how my life is going at the time. My faith in Jesus does not depend on external factors. It does not depend on how life is going. It has no effect on it whatsoever. I am faithful because he is God, because he is the Lord of all, because he is the Savior of the world, and he is the only one who is worthy of my life. And that doesn't change. What happens to me on the outside might change and and, and ebb and flow all at once, but the fact that Jesus is who Jesus is will never change. And that's why I'm faithful. That's why I put my trust in him. It's built on who he is, not what I can get out of it. Healthy soil has no rivals. Jesus is the sole Lord of the land, the sole Lord of my life. There's no competition. You were trying to go, go uh, grow that two acre plot of land, and you see those blackberries. What are you going to do? You're going to chop them down, you're going to get the roundabout, and you're going to kill those things, right? If you check your heart tonight and you say those things competing with my Lord, kill them. Get on your knees. God, repent. This has become an idol in my life. I don't want to live this way any longer. I need your help. I want to live completely and utterly for you and you alone. That is what healthy soil looks like. And healthy soil always produces fruit. If you don't see the fruit in your life and your walk with Christ, in your heart. Does it belong wholeheartedly? God, haven't been born again. As a pastor, I've seen an example of all these. I've seen people go through religious motions with no evidence they've ever been regenerate and born again. I've seen people accept Jesus for a time with great enthusiasm, only to return to exactly how they were two months later. those who let the cares of this world choke any semblance of Jesus from their lives altogether. And as a pastor of this church, I like to think that everyone who calls this place home belongs to Jesus and has been born again and is bearing the fruit. And I know it's probably not the case. Have you been born again? You say we must be born again in the kingdom of heaven. Have you been born again? Is the fruit of the Spirit ever increasing in your life? Can you look at your heart and truly say that it belongs to Christ? And if you can't, repent. Down on your knees and surrender your life to Christ. Give Him complete control and ask Him. want Jesus to come into your life and change everything. Hebrews 3, 7 through 15. I'll get over there too. All right. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. 
They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. If you're convicted today, don't just sit idle and do nothing about it, but repent. And give him what belongs to him, which is everything. Next week, we're going to start talking about evangelism, as I said, and bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. And I think before we start to focus on that, we need to look at ourselves first and foremost and make sure that our hearts are right before God, that the soil is good. So that way we may go and bear fruit for God. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I thank you uh, for your Holy Spirit. God, I, I, I thank you that you love us enough to ask for every single bit of us. That it's not a command of some taskmaster up in the sky, but someone who loves us dearly and, and is not satisfied without having every single bit of us. God, help us to see how foolish we are and how a life lived for ourselves is just a complete waste. A complete waste. Help us to see you for who you are. The Father who sent his Son to take our place, to take our punishment so that we might come back into relationship with you. God, help us to see Jesus for who he is. As our Savior, as our Lord, our Master. And help us just to repent and to surrender everything down at his feet, knowing that his way is best. Help us to see the love you have for us. And to know that there is nothing greater than to lay our lives down and to live for you. God, we love you. We thank you for all we have in Christ. In Jesus' name.